Okay, uh, so we have to go through a couple of administrivia before we uh, start the meeting. One is the fact that we are operating under the Hyperledger or the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. So we have to be aware of that. And that is one of the requirements. The second item is that um, we um, also are functioning under the Hyperledger code of conduct, which means that we should, uh, even if we disagree, we should do that without being disagreeable. So that's, uh, that is, you know, those are the two operating principles here. Uh, no question is outside the limits. And, uh, you know, obviously we have to be aware of uh, the speaker and now um, without much uh, more waiting, let's uh, hear Ashish was shown up here to uh, do his uh, presentation on Will, and he's the CEO of Will, and he has a uh, hard stop at in an, in fifty five minutes. So we probably will end the meeting uh, a few minutes before uh, the end of uh, you know before ten a.m. here, which is I guess um, seven thirty in India. And uh, Ashish, uh, please take it away. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me invite, uh, let me thank Vipin and let me also thank the Hyperledger community for inviting me to share uh, what we are doing at Word. And uh, also, as uh, Vipin mentioned, uh, instead of uh, uh, instead of stopping us a few minutes before, we can certainly carry up to maybe 9.59 a.m. Uh, so that's, that's the beauty of the, uh, that's the beauty of remote work, so diet and remote conferences that we can jump without thinking that if we have to travel a minute or so. So I will be traveling from uh, New York to Boston uh, within a minute or so. So that is how it will work. So, uh, let me start uh, with talking about what we do, what who we are, etc. And I will uh, uh, I will share a presentation so that um, we uh, we have a, a structured way of uh, communication as well. And uh, I will try to keep my presentation to the minimal, and uh, we would open the floor to the questioning as soon as possible, which I will try to instead of. Uh, Typical, uh, um, uh, typical thirty-minute presentation as uh, Vipin has uh, shared with me. I would try to keep it within twenty minutes, and then we can have as many questions as we would like to uh, have. So uh, I believe my screen is shared. So uh, who we are at World? We are a, a blockchain fintech platform from India, and uh, we are a single product-focused platform, uh, which is focused on what we call in India warehouse receipt finance. Across the globe, it is typically known as commodity finance. And uh, it's a very unique concept. Uh, and by the way, it is one of the oldest, uh, rather it is said that warehouse receipt finance is the oldest uh, lending product of the mankind. So we are merging the oldest lending product of the mankind with the newest technology and uh, trying to make uh, it work for the benefit of the people. So who we are, as I mentioned, uh, Globally, we are the first black blockchain platform for agriculture finance. So there have been application in agriculture and quite a few of them, especially in traceability, et cetera. Uh, there have been so many applications on the supply chain and other financing on the, um, on the blockchain. But agriculture financing is something we, uh, we are the first one to do. And also, so far as we understand, we are second independent um, blockchain platform um, across the globe for asset back lending. Uh, first, uh, one being the figure blockchain in the US and the second being world in the uh, one world in India and of course uh, uh, they are uh, they are into the uh, mortgage space and we are into the commodity finance space uh, just as I mentioned we are the largest blockchain platform of India and how uh, I'm talking about pri private blockchains by the way and uh, we have already on our platform we have achieved more than 
half billion dollar worth of um, GMV with a half billion dollar worth of commodities tokenized on the platform. Uh, currently, we are present in 1400 warehouses. We work with uh, a few lenders in India. We have more than $300 million of lending um, uh, corpus allocated for a future lending on the platform. And uh, uh, the platform has been winning accolades both in the um, centralized finance as well as decentralized finance space. Um, we have won awards in India, outside of India, in US as well. So this is what World's Journey is. And actually, uh, the people behind this, which, which is the most uh, crucial thing, of course, for any startup. Uh, so we are 13 people team. Um, we are um, three co-founders out of that. I come from finance background, have spent most of my life in debt syndication. Uh, got introduced to blockchain in 2011, rather it was Bitcoin, there was nothing called blockchain there. Slowly blockchain came and then I got uh, fascinated with that, uh, started working a lot into that direction and uh, slowly from there I went into the startup uh, space itself. Uh, two of my co-founders, Falguni and Abhishek, uh, are from the tech side. Uh, Falguni has around two decades of experience in uh, IT uh, industry, Abhishek has more than four years. Uh, in blockchain and uh, fintech space. And there is a advisory board with supporters from Silicon Valley as well as from here in India and in the financial inclusion space. So this is all and uh, quite a lot of, about us. Uh, we'll be moving more to uh, what the solution is. But before I talk about what the solution is, I would just like to talk a bit about what the vertical is. So when we talk about warehouse receipt finance or we talk about uh, uh, commodity finance, it's a very simple product. It's an asset-backed loan, a no-flow-based uh, calculations, eligibility, etc. And here, what happens that a commodity owner, and uh, the commodity can be any commodity. It can be an agri commodity in the agri space. It can be metals and minerals in the uh, in the metal space, and it can be uh, even crude oil in the energy space. Rather, uh, largest market to share across the globe is so which is a 200 billion dollar industry in itself uh, across the globe largest market share is metals and minerals followed by um, energy products and finally it comes to agri agri financing um, in india it's an agri financing product and the idea is very simple you own a certain commodities as you're supposedly uh, a, a farmer for example here in india we work with farmers so a farmer has um, commodities after the house and when the harvest happens, um, farmers uh, typically will be at a loss if they sell their product uh, at that prevailing market price. Because uh, as uh, anybody having, uh, um, having exposure to agriculture will know that the market prices during the harvest period are the lowest because all the supply of the entire year comes to the market. So they would like to hold the, uh, the, uh, hold the commodity and sell it at a later stage. Same with miners, uh, they would like, they are mining on a continuous basis, need not be that the demand is on a daily basis, so they would be storing it. Similarly, traders, exporters, anybody into the supply chain uh, has uh, quite a lot of inventory with them uh, as part of the business process. What warehouse receipt finance or the commodity finance does, that it allows them to monetize that asset. So what they have to simply do, they have to bring their commodities to a warehouse. The only condition in commodity finance is it is typically a third party warehouse and not a captive warehouse. And if it is a captive warehouse, it is handed over with lock and key to the bank. It means it becomes a bonded warehouse solution. Unlike a typical working capital finance, which is um, given based upon the, the, uh, based upon the stock lying in the premises or the warehouse or the factories of the manufacturers or other trading concerns. Warehouse receipt finance works on the principle of bonded warehousing, either with lock and key or either third party warehouses which are associated with the banks. So commodity is deposited and then what happens, there is a person there which is typically a bank agent known as collateral manager whose job is to verify the quality and the quantity of the stock. At that stage, of receipt is issued by the warehouse. As I mentioned, it's a third party warehouse, not the warehouse of the uh, warehouse of the borrower itself. So a receipt is issued that uh, this say, for example, 10,000 metric ton of uh, uh, wheat deposited by ABC in warehouse uh, XYG. And there uh, the quality mentioned is X, uh, a, see, for example, again, uh, quality is XYG. So there, 
a receipt is generated and that receipt acts as a uh, as a security and that security is offered to a bank and it uh, against that the lending is done by the bank uh, in indian markets um, we have a similar product or you can think of such, something like a loan against security so a loan against a bond where uh, a bearer bond for example where the bearer bond is handed over to the bank and then loan is given against that or in india very popular product gold loan so gold is given to the warehouse gold loan is actually a special uh, type of commodity finance only so this is the product and uh, i thought that it will be better to give an introduction of and this is actually uh, where we are working and why we are working and why we selected blockchain for this solution we will talk about that so though you know, the problems of the industry have been there for last uh, uh, since the inception of the industry this industry has a lot of fraud problems and uh, in covid time it has actually accentuated a lot uh, banks last year on a total market size of 200 million 200 billion dollars last year banks suffered a 13 billion dollar fraud into this a number of European banks and um, have uh, actually, some of them have shut down the business, some of them have cut down on it. Uh, some of the banks, uh, global banks have, to, uh, I mean, even uh, uh, banks in uh, Asian and American markets have cut down their exposure in commodity finance. Actually speaking, their earning from this market has gone down by 40% in just two quarters. But commodity markets will, uh, till the time humankind is there, commodity markets will be there. So new lenders, typically hedge funds, are coming to the market and replacing the banks into the segment. And what happened and what are the problems? Let's discuss that. So the first problem, which was indicated in the previous slide, frauds of billions and billions of dollars. And they keep occurring every year. It's not like uh, they are just like a one-time occurrence or something like that. Uh, every year, both in India as well as globally, I have seen, if I take last 10 decades, uh, in India, we will have at least a few million dollar frauds. And uh, in globally, we will have a, at least a few hundred million dollar frauds every year. And then sometimes all of a sudden, like in 2020, we had $13 billion of fraud. Then, of course, uh, this is an industry dependent upon intermediaries. More than that, it's a concentrated portfolio for the banks. Um, uh, for an industry where the total, I mean, it's a $200 billion industry outside of India globally. The larger players actually corner most of the market and the small ticket loans are very low, which actually results into their, uh, which actually results into their uh, such large ticket site frauds. And despite all the, uh, despite all the digitization taking place in the world, this sector still remains largely manual. So for example, Qingdao scandal in 2017 in China was the last one, the biggest one, which actually shook up the industry. And a uh, lot of changes were tried um, by industry. Uh, wherein uh, banks like Citibank, uh, Barclays, almost everyone, HSBC, whoever you can think of in supply chain, got hit. And um, London Metal Exchange stock was there that got hit. Uh, this year, most of the big banks uh, got ING, etc. They suffered uh, in, in Leong and other. So this is, this is a major, major problem. And that's where we brought blockchain to solve these problems. And how do we use, I mean, this is largely, uh, I believe the people here are well familiar with blockchain. They must have already thought of where to use blockchain. But just how do we do that? And we do that without creating an intermediary repository structure. Uh, like uh, we don't have a depository here uh, when we have created the blockchain we connect the warehouses and banks together and uh, uh, i mean so, so how do we do that so first of all of course so what uh, there are two type of frauds now one is the borrower related or uh, we can say uh, borrower related or receipt related so your receipt can be a false receipt anz bank lost 300 million dollars only three years ago uh, against 82 just 82 receipts issued by one of the largest traders of the world. I mean, supposedly issued by one of the largest traders of the world. Second part, multiple lending, major problem, whether you look at the Chindao scandal, whether you look at uh, Singapore scandals, whether you look at uh, uh, Hin Leong, whether you look at Agri-Trade, everywhere you have multiple lending. And um, that's a major thing which uh, uh, banks are suffering from. So we use... Uh, 
blockchain again there to uh, stop those incidences of multiple lending, which is in blockchain's language, they will call double spend problem. Again, I'm talking about Chindao, India as well, ICICI, NSCL. Lending capacity is X, the total lending in the warehouse, supposedly total warehouse capacity is X, the lending is 5X because there is no single source of truth. So a borrower is using the same warehouse for lending, which is actually linked to multiple lending any which way. So that is again where we use blockchain. Now one more part is physical frauds, which of course uh, uh, blockchain can play only little role over there. So we are actually, we have brought uh, certain uh, technologies uh, controls point over there in terms of web risk linkages with blockchain in terms of uh, quality data linkage with blockchain in, uh, and quality ensuring that the quality is measured through machines and not by manual inspection. Uh, we have brought geotagging and photographs with uh, geotags of the stack of the trucks, etc. All that is being uploaded on blockchain. And something which we are working upon, we have not yet brought to the market is our machine, um, our computer vision solution uh, about monitoring the physical warehouse. So that's the part where the IoT and interaction of IoT and blockchain takes place. And we have done that. Uh, it's uh, without any intermediary in between. Uh, World provides the technology solution connecting the banks and the warehouses directly without World acting as intermediary or uh, while creating an intermediary structure, which is like in the equity markets or the capital markets. Uh, I mean, in India, we call it uh, uh, depositories uh, who are essentially uh, repositories for uh, equity data. So similarly, depositories in commodity markets have been tried in India as well as outside of India have not been really successful. So we ensure that without that intermediary uh, depository, uh, we create um, uh, blockchain structure. And we have created end-to-end -end digital solution, which is a hybrid solution. I will talk about that a bit later. So what we have on world today is we have custody on the same platform um, through our partners, credit on the same platform, quality assurance through on the same platform. And also now, uh, I mean, using blockchain, what is we essentially do is we generate an NFT warehouse receipt. So long before NFT was a craze, uh, and we created NFT and we have built a solution on that. So we are now, um, actually we have certain regulatory challenges around that in India, but uh, uh, we have already developed the platform for trading of these uh, warehouse receipt NFTs. And also going forward, other solutions can come into play. So we have three parts of it. And uh, uh, one is the tokenization platform as well as digital lending platform. We connect that to a borrower digital lending protocol. And finally, as I mentioned to you, we have also generated, created a warehouse e-trading platform. So any commodity which is in the warehouse already converted to an NFT can be traded. Uh, it is a very uh, easy um, uh, 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 diagram to showcase uh, how it works. So it's a hybrid solution, by the way. Uh, our borrowers are not on the blockchain uh, because of of course, the major reason being that on-ramp, off-ramp, uh, onboarding of, uh, especially the transactions of fiat will not work in a country like India. So we have to have a separate structure for the borrowers. And then we have, a, uh, we have the blockchain which connects the B2B participants. So the banks, the warehouses, the collateral managers, which are essentially auditors um, are part of the solution. And then we have oracles here for the purpose of pricing. Again, because it's an asset-backed loan, the price of the asset can keep fluctuating, which requires that the borrower may require have to submit their uh, a mark to margin uh, on a daily basis, on a or a weekly basis, regular basis. So we use that oracle for the purpose of automated M two M calls, and the borrowers actually connect to that, so that we have entire digital lending solution. The borrowers essentially connect to that using a mobile app, which is a normal Android mobile app. And it actually allows the borrowers to communicate with the banks or warehouses. So just a simple transaction, the borrower uh, brings their commodities to the warehouse. I will skip a few steps where our app comes into picture. The commodity is deposited in the warehouse. At that point of time, there will be a, 
audit check, which is done today largely by people. We are bringing some of them on the IoT solutions and some of them on the machine solutions so that the machine and blockchain can interact directly and take the data from there. And at that point of time, uh, NFT is generated on the protocol. So, um, and which is, uh, which represents the deposit made by a particular borrower. Say for example, the borrower depo deposited 10,000 metric ton of wheat. So it, the receipt says that it's a 10,000 metric ton of wheat, quality grade being B plus based on these, these, these parameters. And that NFT gets shared with the banks on the platform. Uh, I don't need to explain to this crowd how that happens. And a digital, because it's a digital receipt, a copy also gets translated on the mobile app. The borrower has to press one single button, apply for loan. Each and every NFT has a connection directly. I mean, it is not like a borrower will say, I will have a say, a, a, say half million dollar or $1 million loan. The borrower has to apply against each and every NFT so that we can maintain all these uh, problem. I mean, so that we can keep the problems away from our ecosystem. And then the loan application comes to the bank and the banks, then the process moves to banks for banking solutions where the banks existing underwriting process work and then the lending takes place. In India right now, we don't have any on-ramp on off-ramp between fiat and crypto on this side uh, because of regulatory issues. So the lending, uh, the money is transferred to the borrower's bank account without involvement of blockchain into the process. Later on, so when the blockchain comes in, uh, when the receipt is generated, the lending takes place. So then the lien is created, the smart contracts come into picture. Uh, the lien is created in the warehouse, in the warehouse ERP, if there is any ERP uh, at the bank level and with the borrower so that the goods cannot be removed. And that's how we stop the multiple lending problem. Once a lien is created by a bank on our protocol or even by a bank outside of our protocol, but if they have sent a lien request to the warehouse, the lien will ultimately be created on blockchain. That way, it doesn't matter whether the bank is on the protocol or off the protocol, there is no question of a multiple lending. And when the repayment comes into picture, which again comes to the bank directly because of the on-ramp, off-ramp issue, uh, at that point of time, uh, the lien is removed once the repay repayment comes to the bank's uh, account. And finally, uh, we have this commodity trading platform where the commodity can be traded. And also we are building a solution uh, wherein the bank loan, which has been given now, can be actually transferred uh, to the borrower. Uh, so, sorry, transferred to the new buyers. For example, a person, a farmer took a loan and now he's selling it to a trader and the, or an exporter. And the exporter, uh, so what the exporter does, that exporter gets the funding from the bank and uh, only rest of the money, which was, uh, if there is any balance amount that is paid to the farmer. So that is what something which is, uh, has been built. We have yet to launch that. Uh, this is an architecture which showcases exactly the same uh, conceptual diagram in a different uh, technical language. So in, on the interface side, we have warehouse ERP integration uh, and then the borrower app, the warehouse web panel, so if there is a ERP in the warehouse, we integrate. Otherwise we have a WIPS app also now where the uh, warehouses can interact with this ecosystem and can manage their inventory as well. And then uh, if the bank uh, is not integrated, typically we integrate with bank, but if it is not integrated for them also, we have created a, a web solution, but that, uh, that doesn't, uh, that requires a lot of uh, double work. The data comes from uh, all these interfaces uh, and as I mentioned to you, we have a hybrid solution. So what we do that some of the data, especially the PI related to the borrower and um, for example, uh, um, uh, for example, a lab report, which came later, uh, all those we keep outside of the blockchain. Any receipt related data means the receipt generation, which is the NFT, lean on that, lean removal on that, uh, trading of that, all that comes on the blockchain. So data comes to our uh, bridge from where we, some of the data is passed on to uh, MongoDB and some of the data is passed on to MongoDB is our uh, NoSQL database and some of the data is passed to the blockchain. And on top of that, we have security layer, which is uh, which helps us to connect with the core banking solutions at the bank. 
uh, this is what we have done at world so far. And we are now taking it to DeFi. So DeFi is the first thing which we will be extending beyond uh, within our two to three months period. Our, uh, we already have some of the DeFi transactions taking place on, uh, uh, on the testnet. So we will be launching that. And the second part is we are also looking at uh, launching units for retail investors, wherein only not only the lenders, but also uh, retail investors can uh, buy the uh, asset-backed units, which can, uh, I mean, in, uh, in the language of uh, lending, we can call it a securitized units um, and can be uh, given. Those are the two things. And as I mentioned, and as most of you would recognize that it's an asset-backed lending platform. Any asset that comes to lending has these three parts, a lender, a borrower, and a custodian. In this case, warehouse is the custodian. In other asset cases, there are other custodians of either the assets ownership, for example, uh, uh, for example, repositories in case of, or depositories in case of equity, uh, or in case of mortgages, there are uh, titles companies in the US. In India, we have registrar of properties. So those are um, uh, the, those, that's the simple structure of any asset back loan. So we are, we are looking to extend world platform uh, over a period of time to those assets as well. And as I mentioned, uh, I took more than five, um, five more minutes instead of 20. Uh, so, but we are still on time. So this is all from my side and I will be certainly open to any question which you uh, guys have. Uh, thanks a lot once again. Thanks, Ashish. Um, there are a couple of questions on on the chat window. Chat. Okay. Uh, first question is from Money. Money Pillai. Have you looked into connecting the receipts slash NFTs with the commodity futures exchange? That's the first uh, question. Sure. So. Uh, instead of commodity future exchange, as I mentioned, we have our exchange ourselves. So, so these are all physical commodities. So we are looking at connecting them with physical exchanges instead of uh, with the futures. However, they can serve as, these warehouse receipts can serve as collaterals for future. For example, if you're, you have say 10,000 metric ton stored in a warehouse, you can use that uh, for sell, selling a future against that as a collateral. So that's a possibility in the futures market, but uh, typically it's a physical uh, asset instead of a derivative. Okay, the second question is from Jim. If you have done a securitized warehouse loan to an investor, what was the interest rate? Uh, and uh, he says, and the terms of that loan. So uh, we have not yet done a securitized transaction. Uh, we have already, we are working with the lenders like banks in India and the rate of interest varies depending upon who is the borrower and who is the lender. So it varies from 8% per annum to 13% per annum in India. Uh, and uh, in India, actually interest rates are higher. So it may, uh, in different markets, it can be different. Again, term is typically, the term for this loan is three to six months, but sometimes corporate buyers can get a rolling limit. So they deposit, um, so say for example, a limit of $1 million is given to them. They keep depositing commodities and the limit keeps getting uh, used and uh, that way the rolling continues. So there is not a clear value for these loans now. No, it's already a $200 billion market, except that the lenders are the banks and the NBFCs. Okay. I uh, hope I'm reading that clear. Uh, well, Jim will ask if it's not clear to him, um, but let's proceed a little bit here uh, because uh, Robin has asked, have you already decided how to implement user authentication and authorization? So uh, we have actually have a user authentication and uh, authorization for this purpose. Uh, as I mentioned uh, that uh, authorization levels are uh, in case of already integrated solutions, author authorization level is carried out at the core and from where the, the logging is taking place. Uh, 
in a warehouse where the ERP is integrated, for example, authorization is built into the SAP ERP or any other ERP solution. In the banking industry, it is uh, built at the bank's core, uh, core banking level. Uh, we authorize them to access our platform through the APIs. And that is where we have built our own controls. Um, there's another question. Which blockchain protocol have you used? So essentially our blockchain protocol is so customized that it will be difficult to say that uh, now, uh, but uh, for the consensus protocol, for the consensus mechanism, we use quorum protocol. The Quorum blockchain. Okay. And NFT is generated on Quorum blockchain. So the blockchain part is uh, Quorum. Yes. Which you're integrated with uh, integrated with the other uh, other parts that are off chain, which you have already mentioned. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, more than that. Uh, the smart contracts have been very customized. They don't conform to any sort of a standard like uh, ERC-720 or um, uh, for example. So we don't use Quorum's uh, functionalities in the, uh, most of these parts other than the consensus mechanism. Uh, authorization for control on transactions, etc., also has been done uh, by us instead of using Quorum's existing uh, uh, Trans, uh, transaction control uh, network, uh, transaction controller, etc. Option um, UJS. Uh, Robin also asked, uh, "Is there a link to a public blockchain?" Uh, not yet, but um, on the testnet we have created with Ethereum and uh, Binance uh, smart chain. On the testnet, it is there. It will be a part of our DeFi protocol. Uh, when we will be linking uh, uh, this uh, part to uh, our public blockchain. And that's why when we started working, Quorum was selected for that simple reason. So uh, with this thought process in mind that if it has to be connected to a public blockchain, Quorum and Ethereum will be very good, easy to connect with each other. Okay. Um, this is uh, Mark Liberati asking, how is physical asset validation done at the warehouse level vis-a-vis -vis the validator node to mitigate the risk of multiple NFTs being created against the same physical asset in the warehouse? How is the validator node chosen and consensus achieved? So uh, that's, a, that's a really a great question. And most of the, our banker friends end up asking this question. Now, uh, even when we go to the banks, that's the same, uh, that question always comes into picture. What about physical part of it? So right now, there are two elements which we have done that. Um, physical is, as we know, blockchain uh, is uh, it's a, uh, not the right solution for achieving physical controls. So what we have done there, that we, first of all, that's why we get the warehouse, which is the custodian of asset on the blockchain. And the entire transaction of the uh, warehouse is mapped on the blockchain itself. That way we have all the information, even for all those receipts, which are not coming. Say for example, a warehouse has deposits of 100,000 uh, 100, metric ton um, and only 20,000 metric ton worth of deposits are going for lending. So still, because we onboard the warehouse, first of all, we have data for each and every transaction taking place. That way, what we ensure that this data, that what is happening in the warehouse is shared with the block uh, bankers. That ensures one part, that anything, if a multiple NFT is created at the max, uh, the, the such sort of a risk is limited to the warehouse capacity. So for example, if the warehouse has 70,000 metric ton, worth of asset at the max the nft can be created is 100000 tons unlike chindao scandal where it was 5 x or unlike some of our uh, problems here in india as well it will not go to 4 or 5 x of the capacity so one control has been established there using a uh, warehouse uh, 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 using warehouse uh, capacity and by onboarding the warehouse uh, itself the second part there is that that is where the role of the uh, collateral managers come into place. So we have collateral managers onboarded on the blockchain and their entire report about the quality and com quantity comes into 
the on the blockchain but other than that because that's a hundred percent physical ver verification um as i mentioned earlier that to avoid these physical frauds we have also created uh, some other structures like waybridge of uh, which uh, data we get on the uh, blockchain um, along with that we are getting the photograph of the lots and the stock of the warehouse and uh, with along with geotags and also with time restrictions like when the time photo was taken it should have been taken within a within three hours uh, of the waybridge uh, uh, with uh, getting the waybridge data so those solutions have been inbuilt uh, and uh, also we are working on machine uh, learning and computer vision solutions to ensure that whatever comes in and out of the warehouse is a uh, monitored but those are uh, those much you know, computer vision solutions are uh, a bit ahead in the future so we are trying to control that aspect as well um, we have been able to ensure that it will the ghost collateral we call it ghost collateral problem that will never cross the warehouse capacity how is the validator node chosen so our warehousing partners and our banking partners are the validator nodes consensus is achieved through the raft mechanism so we ensure that 67 percent uh, of the nodes are in agreement before consensus can be achieved. Mm. Joseph has asked one question. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, please go ahead. Jigo, uh, Joseph, yeah, you, you were right. So uh, please go ahead. So uh, can you provide details of DeFi roadmap? Uh, our token sale will be starting uh, in the month of September. Um, uh, and uh, after that, we will be going on the mainnet. So October, we expect our solution to be on the mainnet. Testnet solution has already started working. The lending pool has not yet been created, but the NFT which we are generating here is already being pushed to, uh, to, to public blockchains. October, you will see us having on mainnet. And after that, uh, uh, we will be looking at creating our own DeFi uh, lending pool for this asset. So now using um, the units and now using the DeFi protocol, we are looking to uh, let anyone across the globe, uh, first of all, lend or invest against these uh, you know, securities. Is that in fitting with the regulations of the government of India or, I mean, how, so, how, how does the government view this? Uh, government is not going to view it very, um, very favorably. So, but we are 100% compliant organization and whatever compliance we have to do, and we have thought around that. We have, I also have, uh, being a CPA, I have around a lot of experience working with compliance. So we have uh, created a compliant solution around that, uh, but we will implement that once we go there. That's one. Second part is that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, countries uh, around the world where DeFi and um, will not create a lot of regulatory issues. Uh, so we are looking to use uh, uh, those countries and assets in those locations. Uh, DeFi will not only focus on commodity finance, commodity finance will be leveraged, which is our existing business, but other asset back, other real asset back DeFi, which is missing from DeFi right now, is what we will be building to the, uh, uh, what we will be bringing to the uh, table. So what are, what are those countries where the mm -hmm. DeFi is uh, so, not regulated or, or regulated and they have very, very uh, um, definite? Singapore uh, for, to start with, near mm -hmm. a neighbor of India. And uh, if you look at in Europe, Germany is now uh, regulating uh, uh, these sort of uh, tokens. Um, and asset tokens, Switzerland is regulating them as well. Uh, in the US, uh, it is still the Howey test uh, comes into play where, whether it will be a security or not. So we can say that the US and India are markets where it is. So in India also, by the way, right now there is nothing in uh, which says that you cannot issue a token or which says that you cannot have an asset back token. Uh, what Indian regulations are that uh, uh, when uh, you are lending uh, from across the globe, then there are restrictions. So we have restrictions on what we call external commercial borrowings. So, but there are exceptions to that, that how that can be brought to India. So we are working on those solutions, uh, which will allow us to create this bridge between the traditional finance and the decentralized finance. Like, uh, you know, for example, uh, the one of the biggest problems they want to control is capital flight. 
because India does have capital controls. And obviously this would be one way, if especially if there are external borrow borrowers to have, um, cap you know, to be subject to capital flight. Um, uh, yes, but that cap is quite big. It's 750 million uh, USD on ECB. I mean, there are other restrictions. There are other calculations which come into play, like what is your debt equity ratio, et cetera, for, for like banks or NBFCs, they are allowed to borrow from ECB markets, uh, but subject to control. So, of course, um, I mean, right now we don't see that uh, a billion dollar of uh, uh, pool are being created, all of a sudden. Okay. Uh, so, any other questions, guys? Or Yeah, hi, Ashish. Uh, I just had a couple of questions. One yeah. is, uh, given the uh, regulatory structure is not clear in India as of now, so so where have you set up uh, your company and uh, how have you funded your business until now? Well, it's set up in India. Uh, we are a blockchain company. We are a blockchain technology solutions in India. We don't have any, uh, any uh, asset. Uh, we don't have anything which, is, uh, which can be called a monetary token. I uh, mean, so that is where India's stance is, right? Uh, so it is 100% Indian uh, entity. Our DeFi entity will be outside of India. It okay, won't so be. So where would that be set up? Uh, that will be set up in Singapore. That will be set up in Singapore. Okay. And how have you funded your business until now? And what are the plans for the future? So uh, we will be starting our token sale uh, in, uh, um, in September, uh, which will be for DeFi solutions. Our world is funded through internal accruals and also through promoters on contribution. Thank you. So in world, we have not yet raised any fund. All right. Any other questions, guys? Okay. Um, in, so um, if there is no question, then I would uh, like to answer Jim Masson's question, which was that as a lender, I can't define the rate for these loans. So uh, typically, uh, how we see in India uh, that uh, lending rates are defined by the lenders um, based upon their cost of um, uh, their cost of uh, funds as well as uh, uh, the uh, the prevailing uh, what we call in India uh, the prevailing bank. Uh, uh, I mean, there is a technical word for that, but you can call it an Indian uh, MIBOR sort of a structure. So similar to LIBOR in India, we have MIBOR. It is not used officially. Uh, for most of the lending, but uh, that is from where most of the banks take a clue about what the lending route rate in the market should be. And then based upon that, they add a risk premium uh, based upon their cost of plus cost of capital. And based on that, plus they add a risk premium depending upon the what type of loan they are going into. And in India, these loans are specialized loans because they go to agriculture sector. So there is a cost structure which is lower than the uh, lo lower than similar risk profile um, loans in other non agriculture uh, sector uh, yeah jim mason here thanks ashish for that response all i'll say is i've borrowed a lot of money in a lot of different contexts on the business side and i'm familiar with working with lenders and uh, call it uh, you know prime rate plus libor plus uh, premiums on loans for different types and different types of collateral the challenge of this market is there's a lot of what i call unknown factors so i'm guessing the risk factor the discount and the risk discount in a sense that gets applied to this system these warehouse loans uh, ignoring the quality history of the borrower which has a big impact Ignoring that for a second, I think the discounts are going to be very high on these. They're not going to be what I call highly favorable to the borrower for the most part. Uh, okay, uh, so I uh, I understand from where you are coming. So certainly, when the banks, there are lenders in India also and outside of India, like hedge funds we talked about, who rely hundred percent on the collateral, not on the borrower history. And then there are lenders who will not, I mean, unless and until there is a history of the borrower will not lend into the segment. So you are 100% right that if the reliance is only on collateral, typically the rate of interest will be much higher. 
Well, and actually, to your point, all the loans I'm talking about are collateral-based loans. They're, they're not based on the credit history. What it is, it's the premium that the lender assigns does relate to the credit history the lender has experienced with a borrower for sure, but they're, they're all collateralized loans of different types. And all I'm saying is the challenges in this type of a market probably lead to relatively high discounts. I know we don't have any real market data at this point. It's a guess, but I'm, you know, just relative to other types of collateral. I agree with you. Agree with you. A challenge. Yeah, that unless or until we have a deep securitization market of these loans, we will not really know what market is paying. Yeah. I mean, uh, then it is the bank's uh, best guesses. Right. But, that, but definitely, this is good, a great solution. And I thank you for your presentation. It's been awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Zim. Okay. The other, I, the other points would be that there's probably over collateralization, similar to what's happening in DeFi, uh, DeFi space, uh, you know. And then based on the uh, Oracle based price, there might be margin calls uh, and other sort of activity there. Uh, that's one. The second is we're familiar with a, another solution for invo invoice financing, which uh, suffered from similar problems, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they have solved it using, um, let's say registries but hmm. invo invoice financing is slightly different in the sense that uh, there is no physical collateral, um, th but there is the invoice which can be double spent, similar to uh, what you have, what you're doing here. Uh, so, are there such registries, for example, for the lien where the liens can be enforced, or is it purely through the bonded warehouse? Um, procedures where the lien is enforced through the bonded warehouse. Like, you know, you cannot take the commodity out because it's physically constrained by the warehouse. Because when Jim was talking about uh, collateralized lending, you know, for example, even a car is collateralized. Uh, I mean, a, a asset back security uh, lending for a car finance or something else, but a car is completely under the control of the of the driver, they can probably take it somewhere and sell it. But obviously the same constraints exist there. There has to be some kind of a check uh, that this car has been financed and hence has a lien on it and it cannot be freely transferred because the title will show that. Um, so in all these cases, it's uh, using registries. Um, so I, I mean, you know, you, you are obviously escaping that uh, by having the bonded warehouse. So actually speaking, uh, in, uh, in this also, there can be a registry. Rather in India, there is a government registry which has been, which works for a few warehouses, around 1% of the warehouses in India registered with re registry. It is known as, uh, uh, so we call it repository. Uh, in India, and uh, that registry is there, which says that uh, these this warehouse. But there again, if we have registry, then what is the need of the blockchain? Uh, an entire solution blockchain has been able to do uh, do few things, right? That multiple lending solutions, duplicate receipts. If we create a registry, which becomes a third party source of truth, uh, then I I mean I fail to see that what will be the result. So here actually, blockchain is the registry, right? That's where the blockchains, uh, I mean, to my mind, um, as a non-tech uh, person, I believe that the biggest benefit of the blockchain to the enterprise world is disintermediation. Uh, I don't call it decentralization. I like to call it disintermediation. And a registry is an intermediary. So what blockchain is doing here, that it is getting the warehouse and the uh, bank together. So that warehouse is acting as a, uh, as the and the blockchain is acting as a registry. Let's take it to the car example. In the car case, who, who is the registrar? Uh, so there is a registrar of in India. We call it um, uh, call it. Uh, uh, so we have a registrar of vehicles here in India as well. So uh, or in case of uh, for example mortgages, there is a registrar of properties. So if those registrars are there, then uh, 
what happens then uh, you have a centralized registry and there is uh, if we bring the same ecosystem here then we are enabled to take benefit of the blockchain then it becomes uh, like uh, just replicating what is the system there so how do we how do we do that in other way i mean how it is possible to do in other asset back loans that today the registrar registries are centralized how do we ensure that the registries become decentralized and that can be possible in car loans actually speaking we have a every vehicle has a vehicle identification number uh, the moment uh, the vehicle is um, uh, gets out of the factory doors before that if you put that vion on a blockchain and connect the entire dealership chain and um, with that um, and finally the borrower when the uh, when the transaction takes place after that it won't be possible and uh, to transfer that um, because when you are going to transfer you are certainly going to check on the uh, on the registry that uh, whether this belongs to someone else or whether there is a loan or not so so in that particular case i see that uh, that's the possibility similar to you have in the so far as i understand my i might be wrong on that that in us therefore our title um, register title registries uh, which are managed by private parties instead of government parties and there are sometimes the title verification can take uh, like uh, 30 to 40 days that is what i have been given to understand and that is where again i see that those titles can be maintained on blockchain uh, from the from the time the land is getting developed uh, without having need of a centralized registry so that is my understanding maybe we will require to uh, do a lot of change around that depending upon how it works in each and every market yeah, I mean, the registries are certainly there, but uh, usually it is uh, delays uh, in uh, actual transactions being there in the registry. That's one of them, uh, because that means that uh, usually you're looking at uh, stale information in the registry. But uh, there is a interesting question by Sandeep Garg. Mm. What is the revenue model for world? Does world take any risk? Is uh, FLDG? I don't know what that means. Yeah. By world required by lenders. Uh, so uh, we have not yet worked on a risk sharing model. Uh, it's a technology solution platform offering to the banks. But to your bank, we have proposed FLDG. By the way, I know Sandeep. By the way, so I know. Uh, I mean. So to Sandeep's bank, we have recently proposed a different way of working. Okay. So, so FLDG is, uh, FLDG is actually a risk sharing mechanism in India uh, used by fintechs, so the, uh, fintechs to partner with the banks. Okay. So we are coming to the end of a delightful hour. Um, and I think Ashish has other commitments, but uh, you know it brings to the fore certain problems uh, that uh, we know of when you uh, physical assets are connected to lending and how do you verify and trust. Uh, other than just being a registry, the blockchain helps one to speed up the process if. Uh, the various parties are properly connected. Second, the processes are uh, automated to a certain extent. Yes. Uh, so that makes a difference. And the third is, since you have multiple pathways of checking, it is not just some entry in some registry maintained by some centralized party, but also IoT-based checking, way bridges, um, physical checking by the collateral managers. Uh, this becomes uh, much more, uh, much stronger than just relying on, you know, one mechanism. And that's why blockchain is powerful, not just because of the fact it is a central registry. So uh, that, is my, that is my understanding of this. And thanks for the great session and this agricultural um, commodity-based stuff is very, very important, especially in India and of course in other countries, although we, we kind of are um, 
disconnected from agriculture in some ways, but in India, uh, you know, there is a huge 80% of the people are dependent on direct agriculture. I don't know whether smaller parties, cooperatives and so on can participate in this, but that's another question. Uh, I have know, given hundred, I have given hundred dollars loan also on the platform. Okay, so that's good. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the connection between the latest uh, agricultural reforms with the Mundi system and the other system, and there's been a war going on in India. So this is a very sensitive topic. Uh, we can talk about that later, but thank you for a delightful session, 9.59. Uh, at uh -huh. my time and uh, thank you again and hopefully uh, we can continue this discussion and uh, sure. learnings of course thanks thanks a lot Vipin and uh, I'm looking forward to be part of uh, these sessions as an or as a part of the uh, attendees going forward uh, certainly I'm uh, sure that there will be a lot of learnings coming from that thanks for inviting me and thanks everyone uh, one for all the detailed questions as well as listening to me. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.